Good morning, uh, Sarah Club. <laughs> Thank you all for, for being here this morning, for waking up so early to be with us. So let me first, uh, it's not too late yet, but let me first uh, wish you a happy and creative new year. Uh, usually we say we have until the end of January to do so, so I wish you a very good year filled of uh, happiness, health and uh, successes. So today we are happy to, uh, to run this uh, fifth Creative Morning. So we started uh, Creative Mornings in September. I had the great chance to, uh, to meet Daniel, uh, maybe it was four or five years ago. Daniel was looking for uh, Phalanx to uh, interview about the situation in Thailand. And so that's the first time I got a chance to, to meet Daniel. And so we had a very nice interview at the Bangnan Cafe here close by in Ekamai. And since then, we kind of, of stayed in touch. And so I'm sure you have seen uh, Daniel on TV, on Thai uh, TBS, and um, also on Channel 5. And you're going to see him even more very soon. So next month, he's launching his new show on Channel 5. And I'm sure he will tell you a couple of words about it. So please give a warm welcome to uh, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. So what do you have? Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a great idea, this Creative Mornings. And it's an honor for me to be part of it. And uh, it's funny, you know, they always say, some people would rather die than speak in public, which means if you're, if you're asked to give a speech at someone's funeral, they did a, they did a poll to, to challenge and ask people what they would rather do. And most people said they would rather be the dead person than the person speaking, which is, which is incredible. And uh, speaking in English, which is my native language, it's wonderful. I love it. It's much more challenging to speak in a second language. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. But first, I want to start by saying, Majpo, Pongwiti, Daniel Fraser, Hdun E. Nadip. Maybe no one got that. Let me, let me, let me try one more time, just, just to be sure. Majpo, Pongwiti, Daniel Fraser, Erdun E. Nadip. Looks to be the same kind of confusion. I think you know what I'm trying to say. I think you know that I mean, good morning. My name is Daniel Fraser, and it's great to be here. Raise your hand if you knew that's what I was trying to say. I know you did, my <laughs> You Star Trek fans, I know you knew. You knew what I was trying to say because of something that is the secret of any language, and that is, context. You didn't know what those silly words mean. <coughs> In fact, neither did I. But you knew the context of what I was trying to say. And my talk here this morning is about overcoming the mental obstacles of learning a language and using context in a very simple way to learn any language and to learn to communicate in, in any language. So first of all, a little bit about me. Thank you, Vincent. That was very nice of you. I, uh, I'm Canadian. I've been living in Thailand now for 16 years. I have a travel business. It's a luxury adventure travel company called Smiling Albino. And we take people off the beaten track. We take people into very remote corners like Nan and Isan and things like that. Not always Phuket, Chiang Mai, Pattaya, those kind of places. We like to go off the grid. To operate in those areas, you really need to speak Thai. Otherwise, it could be very frustrating trying to get things done. And uh, as Vincent mentioned, I've had a lot of great opportunities in Thailand. One of them was to be the host of a Thai PBS program called Long Krum for three years. And that was a Thai language Sarakadi, a documentary series, which was an incredible experience for me because I'm the first person to tell you my Thai is terrible. And yet, I had the opportunity to film 130 episodes of a Thai language television series. And there's a bit of a secret to how that works. <laughs> thank you, thank you. As well as the Thai Tourism Authority has asked me to be a, uh, an ambassador, a presenter. So I go around the world promoting Thailand, which you might think, how crazy, this, this Farang, this Canadian guy, travels around the world promoting Thailand. Why? 
And I like to call myself a cultural travel enthusiast. Now, I have never taken a formal lesson in Thai until very recently, until the last couple of months I'm working on writing. I've never sat in a, in a schoolroom. I've never used a textbook. I've never had a teacher. I've never gone through the alphabet. But how is it possible that I filmed 130 television episodes in Thai? How is it possible that I fly around Thailand for corporations like Singh and others speaking at universities, sometimes in front of 1,000 or 2,000 people for two hours speaking in Thai? And I'm going to be completely honest with you. Any, any Thai person here who knows me knows that my Thai is terrible. It's terrible. My tone is awful. My vocabulary is all over the place. My ability to construct sentences is terrible. But there's a secret I've learned. And that's what I'm here to talk to you today about. The secret is about context. And the secret is about the way we communicate. So when we say language, so many people get this idea that language takes place in a classroom or language takes place with books. And the myth is that the harder you study, the more set phrases you can memorize, the better your language will be. And I'm living proof to tell you that that is simply not the way humans work. That's not the way the human brain works, and that's not the way we communicate with each other. So, first thing I've learned is there's three little tricks. Trick number one, I call it, be a kid again. When you're a, when you're a child and you're learning, a few words. You're learning the difference between hot and cold. Nobody sits in a room with you and says, now, Timmy, this one is hot. We're going to write hot, H-O-T. You learn it by going, oh, wow, what was that? That was hot. And the mother says, ah, see, I told you it was hot. And that's, <laughs> oh, and you always remember. You're like, I will never forget that one was hot. So I moved to Thailand 15 years ago with a friend, and our mission was We've got we've to learn Thai like, like kids because, number one, <laughs> we didn't have any money to actually go to a, a Thai school to learn Thai, and we didn't have a lot of time. So we thought, well, if we're going to build a business, if we're going to build a successful travel company, we have to start from the, the way Thai people live. So we didn't rent an apartment in Silom or Sukhumvit or Satorn. We rented an apartment way out in Sukhapi Ban Sam, like way, which is almost almost in Minbury. It's another province. And the reality was, if you didn't learn to speak Thai, you would starve and die, because there'd be no way you could communicate about food. And so the challenge was, every day we'd have a little book and we'd write words. Chicken, guy, uh, pork, mu, and we'd learn a word at a time. The problem was, as I've explained to some people, Thai language is really a first language speaker's language. So growing up in Europe, as I was speaking with Micah here this morning, if you speak German or French or Italian or Spanish with a strange accent, or especially English, people understand what you mean because of context. If you speak Thai with an accent, everybody will be very polite and say, <laughs> They'll be very polite, but no one understands. And it's because Thai is a first language language, which makes the foreigner, makes Farang very nervous when we speak Thai. Because Thai people, and you know this, watching Farang speak Thai is like watching sport. It's very funny, and it's very entertaining. And they're like, oh. <laughs> and that makes us really nervous. So I knew how to order one dish of food, and it was khao pat gai, which is chicken fried rice. And I would go every day to this shop, and I'd get all my energy and my courage, and I would say, Pong Kho, Khao Pat Gai. And everybody in the little restaurant would say, Oh, yeah, he did it, he did it. Khao Pat Gai Chan Neng. And I'd be like, Oh, God, another meal I can eat. And then I'd start to feel brave, and I'd say, Oh, maybe I should try new words. Maybe I should try new words. I've learned so many animals. I've learned, you know, pork and pig and chicken and dog and all these things. And I'd walk into the restaurant and all of the Thai people in the restaurant would say, hey, 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 come on, mala, mala, mala. And they would all be like, what's he going to order today? And it's really exciting for them. And then I'd get really nervous and I'd say, 
ข้าวผัดหมา <laughs> and then everyone would laugh just like you did and I and the owner of the restaurant was น่ารักมาก he would always say โอ้โหวันนี้ข้าวผัดหมาหมดนะครับมีแต่ข้าวผัดไก่ like okay ข้าวผัดไก่ but you know what it did it made me never ever forget what that means and I realized That's the secret. When you're a child, you only learn hot because you go, "Wow, that's hot." You don't learn hot because it is a temperature that is above 37 degrees Celsius, and when you touch it, it is warm to the feeling. Children don't learn like that, and that's how when we learn languages, we need to learn like children. So there we were, my friend and I, trying to build our business, trying to, <laughs> trying to learn to speak Thai. And I remember we went to Chiang Rai, Chiang Rai, which is one of the most beautiful places in Thailand, and we met one guy. Who was going to be our our partner in the business? And we were speaking with him, and our Thai was terrible. We were like, "Pom, yak, panjakayan, mountain, noon," and he would say, "You, panjakayan, by tea, mountain." Yes, yes. And we would like hug because we had this moment, <laughs> just like children when you learn something. And so we started a bicycle tour company, and we started bringing guests from overseas. And after a year of doing this, I remember one day very, very clearly, this guy's name was Kun Bird, P Bird. We called him not Tong Chai, the singer. P Bird, a different P Bird. We had some guests from Canada who were adjusting their bicycles, and I, I heard a conversation in English. About oh the height of the bicycle seat and this and this conversation was in English, so I turn around and there's Kun Bird speaking with our customers in perfect English. <laughs> and this was after one year of me and my little black book saying, "Home, by tea, noon," and he would say, "Ah ah, by that, by that, back home." After one year, I learned he spoke English fluently. And I said, "Kunper, what? The, why didn't you tell me that? I've been struggling for a year trying to sound like an idiot." And he said, "You never asked." <laughs> <laughs> And you know what's funny? He knew that my tie was terrible, but somehow we were able to communicate. And it was all based on, it was all based on this magical thing called context. So, trick number two I've learned is all about context. Now, when people say, "If you could learn a language, or if you could learn context, what would you choose?" Choose context every time. Context, language without context is nothing. And for any of you who've seen uh, one of my programs on Thai PBS, this is an early episode where my Thai was even worse, and I'm trying to communicate with people by using context only, not using language and. Some very strange things happen when when you do that. เราก็เรียกตะโกเรียกกันมากบางทีเราสองของกันก็โวยไปตะโกจากนี่ไปนู่นอย่างเงี้ยค่ะแล้วในในตลาดแห่งนี้ใครเป็นคนที่มีแบบตักตลาดไม่ค่อยมีหรอกค่ะไม่มีเลยค่ะมีแต่แม่ค้าแต่ไม่ค่อยมีปากตลาดมีแต่มีแต่ปากหวานค่ะมีแต่ปากหวานอันนี้เป็นอะไรครับลูกจักรอกก็จะมีไอ้มาอยู่ยาวต่อเอาไปดับอยู่มาแล้วก็จะถึงโพลไม้ต้องจับมะม่วงสอยมะม่วงเขาเรียกเขาเรียกสอยสอยสอยไม่ไม่เรียกว่าจับเขาเรียกว่าสอยสอยไม่ใช่สอยนะสอยสอยอ่าสอยสอยครับผมข้างบนนี้ก็เป็นข้างบนนี้เขาเรียกที่วางวางตะการวางตะการสำหรับดอกไม้โอ้เขาเรียกสาแหลกไม่วางตะกร้าสาแหลกสาแหลกสาแหลกครับผมไม่เคยไม่เคยได้ยินใช่ใช่คำว่าสาแหลกมันเป็นศัพท์ที่ใช้แปลได้หลายอย่างอ๋อเหรอครับครับแปลว่าอะไรครับอย่างสมมติว่าตามหมายของมันอย่างสมมติว่าเราเนี่ยอยู่ด้วยกันในบ้านเดียวกันเกิดทะเลาะเบาแว้งกันอะไรต่ออะไรตากขาดเขาเรียกว่าบ้านแตกสาแหลกขาดเอาลองพูดหมายสิบ้านแตกสาแหลกขาด broken home no basket 
บ้านแดกบ้านแดกสลกขาดได้แล้วนายที่สุดจะพยายามนะ broken home no basket คือบ้านบ้านแดกบ้านแดกสลกขาด It's uh, yep. I survived it. I survived it. That's one of the challenges that any foreigner has learning Thai is that Thai is a language spoken almost entirely in some new ones, in idioms. And if you're trying to understand the words, you'll be so lost, so badly lost. And learning Thai, you have to always think, how do I take myself back to where I was a child? And I just ask, what's this? What's that? Ani k u l a ani le, ani c h u l a And asking words like a child does. Forget. Tone, because foreigners cannot get the tone. Me too. Forget vocabulary. Forget complex sentences and some new ones. Stick with what you know. When you're a child, you only have five to eight hundred words. That's all you need. In fact, you can. I I spent three years filming a television program, and I had maybe eight hundred words in my head. But I was able to communicate with people and not focus so much on on the details. But it's about context, and as any foreigner living in in Thailand, context is what makes these kind of things funny. <laughs> Because when you read it in English, you know what it means. No, give food, monkey. <laughs> But then, if you stand back and think, don't get lost in the details. Stand back and think, monkey, no food. Oh. And then you do like Thai people. They say, "Oh, oh, k a o j a i l a o He means no food monkey. Why do we understand it? It's because of context. The language is all funny and silly, but we understand exactly what it means, just like children do. A child would understand this. An adult will think too much and go, "Maybe the monkey is speaking in third person." To the person giving the food, and it's a parable about children don't think that way. And when we're learning a language, we need to think the way children do. Another example, dear friend, the time has come. Two weeks ago, I was in North Vietnam, and I was ordering food. Boiled friend. I prefer my friends sautéed. It's a little more elegant. But the the beautiful thing is that you know vegetables with boiled friend. Everybody knows what are they trying to say? p a t b a k r u m i t which is it's fried. They're trying to say fried. But if you're a child, and I can see everyone everyone here is an adult, and they're trying to think. Maybe it means if you boil it with a friend, it's more s a n u k to g i n d u i k a n or something. A child will look at that and say, "Oh, oh, no, no, no! He means fried." Because I remember when I made that mistake. The reason we understand is context. If we throw away the details, if we throw away our understanding of how language is supposed to work, and we think the way children think, we know exactly what that means. All oh, fried. Boiled or fried vegetables. I get it. Now, that's the same reason why we see road signs like this in Thailand. <laughs> the beautiful thing here is this really does have two meanings. <laughs> And the problem is, if you're an adult and you're driving down the road and you see that sign, whoop, you will drive off the road and crash. Because you'll be thinking too much about the words. How did they know there's a prick in front of me? Do they mean prick like prick bone? What do they mean? And then if you look at the context like a child would, they read it in Thai like oh, rawang hinlon means oh, there's rocks that have fallen on the road. Oh, brick, brick. They mean brick. Oh, and then it's funny and you understand again. But living in Southeast Asia, for anyone who's a European language speaker or English speaker. Is fascinating, fascinating because when you know the context of what you're trying to say, no monkey give food or <laughs> beware the prick in front of you, you understand it. But what happens when we're adults? We 
throw away that context and we start thinking about the details. And that's how English language training all through Asia has, has failed, is because we don't teach the context and we don't teach people to experience the language. So what happens when the context breaks completely? This one, you really got to think about this one. Prohibit pluck the top feels numb. This is in one of my favorite places in the world. This is in Doi Mae Salong. Have you, anyone been to Doi Mae Salong in Chiang Rai? Has anyone been to Chiang Rai? Doi Mae Salong is a beautiful town. It's Thai Yunnan, Yunnan Chinese, which means that is translated from Chinese to Thai, Thai to English. And that explains why it's so funny. Because someone, I don't know why they would do this, opened a dictionary and translated word for word. So, ham means don't, prohibit. Net is pluck, obviously. And the best part of this is the yacha. Now, if you open a dictionary and you look at, at, at cha in Thai, Meaning number one will be T. And I'm sure the person thought T. No, that's not it. It must be the next one. Meaning number two is like Nepcha, like my, my hand is numb. Now, if you didn't speak Thai or you couldn't read Thai, you would look at that sign and analyze it. And I have seen groups of foreign tourists from America or from somewhere looking at the sign, thinking it's some sage communication from some <laughs> Zen Buddhist monk and they're like prohibit top the zenith of the universe feels numb it's the way and then Thai people come up and they go no 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 pick no take and then they go oh 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 you mean no the monkey give food <laughs> this is exactly why a child would do a better job at translating that than an adult because the adult is going to think that language is science. I must translate word for word. Cha means tea? Nah, not that one. Cha means numb. Must be numb. Yes, let's use numb. A child would only think, no take. And that would be much better than that sign there, which every time I pass it, I have to stop and just think about how wonderful language is because it's all about experiencing things, not about taking apart the details. And if you look at 20 years ago, 1995, it's an incredible thing. Thailand was number five in ASEAN for language, meaning English language. Today, Thailand is number nine. How did that happen? I think I know how it happened. Because 20 years ago, English language teaching started to become very, very, very scientific and very, very academic and people were not experiencing the language anymore. People were translating exactly like that and setting set phrases and auto responses. One of my best memories is when I was, uh, I was many years ago I had an opportunity to do some volunteer work in a hill tribe school up in, in Mefaluang area and there was one child, Apinit, Dekchai Apinit, I remember him so well. He memorized hundreds of phrases from movies and things. But speaking to him was a little bit like speaking to a robot. And it was very interesting. You know, hello, Appinet, how are you? I am fine, thank you, and you? <laughs> and it would be very, very casual, and you're like... He got a scholarship from uh, Somdeh Pratap. He got a scholarship to go study in England. And I told him, I said, Appinet, you've got to stop thinking about words and phrases because what happens, you don't know how to communicate with people, you lose context. You're going to go to England, you're going to be so excited, you're going to run out of the train station and see Big Ben and go, oh my god, and run and get hit by a car. You'll be lying on the side of the road and someone will come to help you and say, are you okay, are you okay? And you'll say, I am fine, thank you, and you? <laughs> and the person will say, he's okay, he's okay, he, he told me, yeah, we're, we're good. I'm like, I mean, that you need to understand that language isn't about words, it's about context. It's about context. So, what happens when context is completely, completely lost in translation? This one, you might have to think about this for a few moments. This is a birthday cake. 
<laughs> Mr. Jeffrey, <clears throat> happy to cover whatever cost you have. Well, you can imagine the confusion when I took a VIP birthday couple for a surprise birthday cake and they brought out the cake and it said Mr. Jeffrey which is correct his name happy to cover whatever cost you have <laughs> and the first thing we did we made the mistake we didn't think like kids we started going into Google Translate <laughs> happy to cover whatever cost you have and we're like try it in Sanskrit maybe it means something maybe maybe it's something that you know the prophet yogi said or Try it in Chinese. Maybe it means something in, in Bahasa, Malaysian or something. We translated it and Google just kept coming up with question mark, question mark. We have no idea what this means. And then I realized, oh, I'm making the same mistake. I'm thinking about language in pieces and parts like science. I'm not thinking about it in terms of experiences. Then it reminded me of the email that I sent a couple of days earlier to the restaurant. If you look at the top of the email, I'm coming for dinner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> and then the bottom line, the birthday man is Mr. Jeffrey, happy to cover whatever costs you have. <laughs> Who could have guessed that that's what would appear on the cake? That's an example of an adult made that mistake. A child would never do that. A child would say, Mr. Jeffrey, happy, and it would be perfect, and we would love it, and we would understand what they meant. But adults who already know a language, they think in terms of science, and they went, happy to cover whatever costs you have, and they put that on the cake, and you can imagine the honeymoon couple spent an hour trying to use Google Translate going, maybe it means like your it's like astrology or something. You're a Gemini, so maybe you look up Gemini. Yeah, what does that mean? We get lost in the details. We get terribly lost in the details. And for my life, that's you know, one of the most interesting things is I'm not a good Thai speaker, but I'm a great Thai communicator. My tone is like most Parang. It's terrible. But people understand what I'm trying to say. I think like a child and I speak like a child and I've had a lot of Thai people say when you speak Thai it's so cute it's like a child and I, I don't know if that's a good thing or, or a bad thing but <laughs> at least they're being honest right and it's all about context meaning these two guys Peter Sellers if you've seen the movie The Party Birdie Nam Nams it's an absolutely amazing movie and that character inspired Mr. Bean who's a phenomenon you know what we love about this show? There's no language. There's almost no language, but there's a lot of context. Everybody likes it, everybody appreciates it. Children, adults, doesn't matter if you're a, a farmer or an investment banker, it doesn't matter if you're from Zimbabwe or Thailand or Brazil or New York. Everybody identifies with them because it takes us away from detail and puts us in the experience. And language is all about experiences. So, be a kid again. Don't get lost in details. Always think about context. And then, when I think of back to me, <laughs> when I think of back to my life, I had a lot of incredible experiences doing things that were way outside my comfort zone. I didn't know how to communicate with chabamong, sea seafaring people, fishermen. But I had an opportunity on the top left to go and spend a weekend with uh, a Thai fishing family who catch these aliens, uh, their squids from the river, uh, sorry, the ocean. They speak in a dialect in, in Petpuri province that is so hard for Thai people to understand. Forget the, the Farang, it's hard for Thai people to understand. But I spent two or three days with them I learned so much about their history, about their food, about the way they catch these incredible, huge squids. And at the end of it, I realized, I don't remember any of the language we exchanged, but I remember I have all these new words. I have all these new ways of understanding who they were. And then on the bottom left, something went lost in translation here, obviously, but 
I had an opportunity to go to Water Buffalo Driving Training School, which sounds very strange. And I thought, we have to do this. <laughs> Water Buffalo Driving Training School. This is in Sakao province. They have a, a demonstration farm. If you want to be a farmer, you go and learn how to drive a water buffalo and control a water buffalo, but you have to learn the language. And with my film, my TV crew, we thought, this will be fantastic. We'll go and get the experience right at the ground. Something went wrong, I think, in the translation. I ended up as the buffalo <laughs> here for some time. But the farmers were telling me, no, 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 you have to be the buffalo. And I'm like, they're like, you have to be the buffalo to understand what the commands mean. You have to understand what it feels like to be the buffalo. <laughs> and I'm like, are you doing this just because I'm the farang here and you want to laugh? <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 everyone does it. And I tell you what, it reminded me of when you're two years old and your mother says, hot, cold, whoa, you touch it. When you're the buffalo, you absolutely understand what the words mean. Pat, 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 oh, yeah, all of these words to turn left and right to stop. You'll never forget them because you're experiencing the language. And then when you actually put the reins, the ropes on the buffalo and you're trying to drive it, you already know what the buffalo's feeling. And you're trying to communicate with them because you've been there, because you're part of the experience. You're not part of the, the language or the commands or all the special dialect. It's an Isan dialect anyway, which is hard enough. On the top right, this is an example where early in our business we would spend time with local villagers trying to understand ceremonies. This is a Kaubansa ceremony in, I think, Roy Et province. No one spoke English. And I spent two or three days in this village speaking with people. And my mission was, I need to learn as much about their culture, as much about their language, as much about their, their dance, which clearly I failed badly. As, as I can, and just using context. So dancing and learning and, and listening to them. Why can't we do that in classrooms? Why do we teach children learning a second language that they have to focus on vocabulary? You'll never accelerate your learning unless you're in the experience. And on the bottom right, this is, I put this photo in because it's an amazing experience I had. This is a Karen village in Prachuap, Kirikan, in uh, Southern Thailand. They speak three or four languages in their village. This is a group of teachers, Bagayaw, uh, Bagagayaw, who are Karen people, who are Burmese uh, refugees living on the border. This is me spending a weekend with them, if you can believe, translating their lessons to children in the village from Burmese to Bagayaw to Thai to English. There's about four languages happening. The dangerous part is I was actually teaching Thai, I think, which I don't know how that happened, but incredible thing. They spoke different languages and they spoke to me in Thai. They spoke to each other in Bagaya. They spoke to the kids in Burmese and the kids spoke Burmese or Thai to the teacher and some of them spoke English to me. Nobody was a master at any of the languages. <laughs> it's true. My Thai, as you know, is average and their English was poor. The, Kids that spoke Bagaya, the Korean, they only knew bits and pieces. Burmese was kind of a, a pasaklang, you know, the kind of moderated language, but nobody wanted to speak Burmese for a lot of reasons. So here we were for two or three days trying to communicate with each other, and everybody kept saying, this reminds me of when I was a child, because you have to say, <laughs> and I say, okay, uh, one word, you want to eat, Khao Pad Ma, right? I know what you want to eat, you want to eat the Khao Pad Ma. And we would learn to speak each other's language. I learned Burmese, Bagaya, Thai, English. I learned, it was an amazing experience. None of it had to do with syntax, tone, grammar, vocabulary, structure. It had to do with experiences. And that's kind of, you know, when I think of the secrets of how I've survived in Thai, it's about experiences. The last trick, and I'm showing this purely because if you cannot laugh at yourself, you'll never learn another language. If you cannot accept that people are going to laugh at you, you will never learn a language like Thai, especially for any, any, any foreigners who want to learn Thai. Thai people are going to laugh at you. 
they will laugh at you, and it doesn't mean they're making fun. It's because there's something deep inside the spirit of Sanuk, that when someone's speaking a language, you have to be part of that. So I show this clip because it's probably the most embarrassing and painful two minutes in television history. I was tricked. I spent a day learning Like with a, a performing group. And they told me, tonight we're going to have a little party and we'd like you to get up on stage and, and do a little Like. What they did not tell me is that it was at an annual Ngan Wat, a temple festival with 5,000 people. <laughs> 5,000 people. So I was standing behind the stage and they said, uh, are you ready? And I said, well, I, I, I don't know, am I? And they said, oh, there's one thing we forgot to tell you. There's 5,000 people outside. <laughs> and at that moment, I realized 15 years ago, when I was learning how to order food, I was brave enough to order kaupat gai and kaupat ma. I can do this. And it's painful, but it's important to never be afraid. That's, uh, that's about as, thank you. <laughs> I think anybody who sees that kind of goes, it's hard to watch. It was hard to do. But when I was finished, I realized, wow, that's an experience that you absolutely cannot get in a classroom for them and for me. And if I was afraid of making mistakes, I would have never learned all these things. I would have never had all these opportunities. And thank God I will never do that again. But at least we know. So when I look at my broken, childlike way of learning Thai, I think of all the things that it's done for me in a, in a creative sense. We've got a, a great business going, and I've had this incredible opportunity to host tourism and cultural workshops around the world in both languages, as well as our show has won a couple of awards for the unusual, unique way that we, we tell, tell Thai stories in a, in a very innocent, childlike way. I'm not a master speaker. I'm not a fluent Thai speaker. But I've managed to find a way to communicate through experiences. And it's opened up opportunities. I think the most important thing is language is a passport. Language is a door to opportunities. This picture on the right is speaking at a community gathering in Patani and Naratiwat, where I've been several times speaking about the importance of maintaining your own culture. 
I'm just some Canadian guy who lives in Thailand and fell in love with Thailand and here I am speaking at universities about the importance of culture. And it all happened because I, I wasn't afraid to try the language, to have fun with the language, to play with the language and to enjoy the context. So last speech is a nice one. I don't know who this Charlemagne person is, but uh, no. To have another language is to possess a second soul. I like to say that language is the key to understanding culture and context is the key. And now we have all these neighbors in ASEAN who are speaking English, uh, maybe a little better than we do in, in Thailand. And we have this incredible international audience of people from all over the place, Europe, South America, France. I guess France is in Europe, but it's really kind of its own planet, isn't it, isn't it Vincent? <laughs> and the opportunity that exists in this room alone to understand each other, to understand the world, is incredible. So become a kid again. Don't worry about the details, just have fun with the context, and always be brave. Always be brave and never worry about how it might sound. That's, that's my talk this morning, guys, and I want to thank you for your time and energy and your patience in watching that. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Daniel. So now we, uh, we will welcome uh, questions. We have uh, 15 minutes of, of questions. So anyone has a question for Daniel? Uh, thank you for the talk. Very uh, interesting. Can you talk a little bit about the elements of context? How much are you talking about body language? How much is situation? And how much is cadence? Uh, cadence is a great word, actually, cadence. That's the, that's the third level of understanding, in, in my opinion. Number one, it always starts with, with body language and experience. So when you think of the way children learn, they have a, a handful of words in their head and they run around and they say, look, a beef. And the mother says, no, 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 that's a, that's a cow. But when we eat it, it's called a beef. So it puts the, it puts the, uh, it puts the words in the experience. And it, it's mostly just body language and having fun with that. So learning to eat, the way we learn in our first month when we're babies is all this acting, all this body language in front of us where people are waving and you understand, oh, that means someone is trying to say something to me or, or you know, someone saying, oh, there's a secret, don't speak. So body language, I think, is crucial, absolutely crucial, because when you're reading a dictionary, you don't know, <coughs> excuse me, you don't know what it's supposed to feel like when you say that word. You don't know how the person expresses themselves when they say something like Aroy. There's not a lot of energy in Aroy, but if it's like Aroya, the way some Thai people say it, then you know, oh, that's body language to explain, explain how, how the words are used. Um, cadence, again, to me, that's the same as, as just being in the, in the experience. Cadence is about the tone and the inflection. I tell people never worry about the way you sound. Never worry about the cadence, never worry about the rhythm. But the best way is to listen to other people, listen to Thai people and burn it into your brain, especially if you're a foreigner learning Thai, is burning that way Thai, speak, Thai people speak to each other into your brain. And I've, I've actually read some Thai language textbooks year, years later and I thought to myself, I would never know this language if I was reading these books. Because the situations are not real. You go back and forth in a nonsense conversation. There's no, there's no situation. There's no experience. There's no, there's no energy and, and relationship with what's going on. But if you act it out, play with it, have fun with it, much more important than, than anything you can learn structurally. I don't know if that answered all of your questions or not, but... <clears throat> do, you, do you think that this culture is easier to, to do this? For example, uh, do you think it's easier in uh, Asia, there is more humor, people are more open about uh, humor to laugh, and uh, is it easier, for example, than uh, Europe or some countries in Europe? Because this is the Absolutely. feeling I have, but I'm not sure. But people here seem much more uh, open to the laugh and uh, the self-humor. You talk about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, something, something that is important is Thais, 
there's, Sanuk is part of the DNA. It's part of the culture. It doesn't matter if you're doing language or having, having a meal about food. Sanuk, if there's no Sanuk, there's nothing. And so learning Thai, I think, is more fun and, and a little more creative and a little more interesting because of the nature of, of the people. So for example, uh, I forget your name, but you were saying you went to Russia. I, I cannot imagine learning Russian in Russia because I think the nature of the people is it's a little more direct, it's a little more serious. And if you say something wrong in, in Russian, I'm sure that people will just go. <laughs> Whereas in Thai, they make it fun. There's like saying, say it again, say it again. No, 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 no. say it again. No, 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 no. And then all of a sudden you become part of it. But if you, if you remember the most important rule is go back to when you were a child. Kids are saying crazy things all the time and they don't even know they're saying crazy things. They're saying crazy things to each other and they're experiencing the language together. So in a culture like, like, like Thailand, it's the, really the perfect opportunity to use that childlike way that we naturally learn languages and uh, put yourself in the experience. Much easier, I think, than, than in Europe, learning European languages. And another thing, when we learn a second language in Europe or when, for example, Chinese immigrants that are now coming to Canada learning English, and they're doing it all the wrong way. They're doing it all the wrong way. They're sitting in a classroom saying, good morning, my name is Jing Xiao. And, da, da, da. and there's no fun. There's no experience there. They, they don't know how to take themselves to the child level, and they don't know how to laugh at themselves. Because it's a serious academic environment. And I think, I think that's something that's lacking everywhere that languages are taught. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, uh, I have the misgivings about the uh, efficiency of context in terms of understanding and perception of intangible, abstract concepts. Mm. So w when it comes to, to concrete, observable stuff, Easily, you can use a context to, to promote the meaning and to, to come up with, some, with a sort of mutual intelligibility. However, with the intangible, abstract ideas, I think it's pretty quite unlikely to come up with the solution of the problem by body language or whatever, because that, that's very sophisticated. That's one point. And the other point is uh, about you know, the, the, the efficiency uh, of the importance of contextualized learning. Because still there are, there are theories and scholars uh, like, Paul, uh, like Paul Nation and others were working on, uh, on, the, on the vocabulary ac acquisition. And they, believe, they basically believe that contextualized, uh, although contextualized vocabulary acquisition is absolutely essential, mm. but at the same time, uh, it turns out to be counterproductive in terms of the time you spend and the, the distraction uh, when, yeah. when you, and you can't, you can't focus. So basically, when, when you, you memorize a list of vocabulary items, mm. it's much more effective than learning in through context. Because context is con time consuming, it, uh, it requires proper idiosyncratic, uh, you know, the participants, yeah. the topic, and all that, mm. that, that, yeah. that. That's very, very debatable. So, what is your stance on that? Thank you. That, that was a very long question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, most of it depends on what your goals are. If your goal is to be a fluent speaker, then you can't ignore the abstract uh, dimensions of language. That only comes after a couple of years. The first two or three years you learn a language, you have all these words in your head that are bouncing around and you're trying to find ways to use them. I think one school of thought is called the naturalist approach. Uh, there was a doctor here years ago, Dr. Brown, of some, I think his name was, and he had very much the, the naturalist approach uh, to learning languages. You have 200 words or 600 words. Go out and use those words in every situation you can, and then come back and review what went right and what went wrong. And that's a great way to get the foundations. Uh, your question is, how do you then move into abstract thinking and abstract communication? And I'll, I'll be honest, from my level, for my needs in Thailand, I've never needed to rely on that. However, if I was getting a job in politics or as a translator, of course, I would need to start to understand the abstract thinking and the abstract uh, dialogue. 
which I think you can only get by experience and by reading, reading historical texts. Um, so much of Thai language, for example, is, is idioms and historical references to characters in, in the past and things. And without that foundation, uh, culturally, without the cultural foundation, you'll never really understand the abstract uses of the language. So if your goals are to be fluent speaker, you absolutely have to invest in the time with uh, cultural understanding as well. Um, it is time consuming. People who think that you can learn Thai a few minutes a day, that's ridiculous. You can't. Um, the US Army, I have a few friends in Thailand who learn Thai fast track, six months, you know, 30 to 40 hours a week. That's a great way to do it. I have one friend, his name is Peter, he's an incredible Thai speaker. He learned to speak Thai fluently in uh, California in a school with mostly American students. And he said the strangest experience of his life is that he'd been in school for six months learning Thai with the United States Army. And he arrived in Bangkok, got in a taxi, and realized this is the first opportunity he'd ever had to actually use the language properly. But he, he could speak because he focused on it so diligently for six months. Most humans don't have that kind of time. And I always go back to the simple basics. Children learn by acting, playing, using the words they have and keeping a simple context. So um, many schools of thought. There's many right answers, I think. Um, I think I have a simple question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, when you go to the markets or to the shops and then you talk to the people and they think, oh, he speaks Thai and they speak so fast, do you really get what they want to tell you or do you have something <laughs> like a translator somewhere who's like, hey, he said something like that. Yeah. And you say, oh, kautai, kautai. So, That's a uh, great question. In fact, the, the scariest thing about learning any Thai is that if, you're, if you get enough courage to go and ask someone a question, you're completely unprepared for the answer that's coming back because it's all these new, new words. And the reality is most Thai people, if they think that you speak a little bit of Thai, they will assume that you will understand everything and they will just you know, machine gun the, the, the words back at you and, you, and you're, you're kind of like, I wasn't prepared for that. Let me, let me, let me go back and think. I understand maybe 50 to 70% of what I talk to people in villages with, but I always tell them, and I say, speak slow, I'm a child. And I, I make it fun for them, and they're like, oh, he's slow. We'll, we'll make it simpler for him. So I definitely have to bring them down to my level, <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. No. <laughs> no, not when we're actually filming. No, when we're actually filming. And that's why so many, like I have a new show starting um, next month on Sunday nights and it's shot in full sequence. So I will walk into a village and find someone making food and we'll shoot a full sequence with them just in a camera. And there's a lot of things they're telling me that I have no idea what they're talking about. And I'm like, wait a minute, you just said you have to put this here. And, and, and uh, so I get lost, I get lost. But the brilliant thing is, when you get lost and you make a mistake, you remember. Because the person you're speaking with says, Alina, and then you say it again and she says, no, 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 I mean this and this. Oh, and you remember. So it's, I do get lost and I do get confused, but I always learn something from that, which is good. Okay, let's take a last final questions. Oh, here, Dr. Bundy in front, yes. Okay, let's take two, okay, we have two. two well, uh, I'm your fan, Pante. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Um, from your three approaches, uh, what would be the other or additional approach that you would like to, to use to improve this learning tie? And what would be uh, uh, your future uh, plan for learning Thai? A third question is, what is the most difficult part to learn Thai? Yes. Oh, those are big, big questions. So the, the first question, what are the other approaches? I always tell people, especially if it's, if it's Farang that want to learn to speak Thai, first thing you've got to do is learn to read. And I know that might sound like a conflict because I said, oh, you have to be a child and ch children don't need to, read, to learn to read. We already have the advantage that our brains have developed enough to be able to read when you're learning Thai as an adult. You have to learn to read. 
If you can't read Thai, I don't think you'll ever be a Thai speaker because there are, there are sounds that English letters just can't achieve. Krum, you know, these kind of things. How do you spell that in English? So you have to learn to read. And um, what I think is a great, a great approach is read Thai, but using English words. So for example, one of the ways I learned to read, which, which people thought was so strange, was I would read street signs. Sukumvit Sathorn. I would read it in English because I know what it's supposed to sound like in Thai. And I would try to read the Thai letters to say, okay, so that must be an R, that must be an M. Oh, I've seen that one before. That's the same one on Sukhumvit, so that must be that. And I would learn to read by comparing words that you already know. So if you're trying to learn to read something in Thai, I think start with a, a subject that uses lots of English words but spelled in, in Thai. Um, program, producer, computer. If you can start to computer, you know, if you read those in Thai, you start to see calm, oh, I see that, see, O-M is how call, I, uh, you'll start to read that. And that's a great way because then it triggers the brain to memorize, which helps in vocabulary acquisition. Future plan is, I want to read, I want to actually read lots of great Thai books in Thai. So right now I'm trying to read um, a book from Chat Gobjiti, Kampi Paksa, it's very, very difficult in Thai, but it's a little bit like that gentleman's question. Like when, once you get to a certain level, I want to challenge myself now to understand the idioms that Thai people use and the historical references. And there's so much in Thai literature that is a framework for social commentary, a real foundation. And so now I'm trying to learn reading some Thai books, which is slow, <laughs> very slow, very slow. Did I get your questions? I think I did. Okay. Um, my question is actually a little bit more serious because um, especially with international company and corporation here in Thailand mm. and lots of foreign workers that comes in and it seems like English is still the language where we all communicate even though they are in Thailand. How can we use your three? the context that you are um, for the speech today to actually incorporate that into cooperation because it seems like foreigners that comes to work here don't actually learn Thai or wish to, um, especially in a business setting. It's a great question. I think a lot of foreigners come to Thailand now and spend two to four years and they think, well, why invest in the time and energy required to speak the language because I work with people every day who, who speak English. I mean, everyone here speaks English, so why should I learn Thai? Which I understand, I completely understand that. And also, more people speak Thai today than 40 years ago when the first foreigners were working in, in corporations. So then it was about survival, now it's just about looking cool when you go to a restaurant. When your friends are with you, you're like, hey, I can order this food. Let me say, cow pat guy. And then your friends won't know the difference because they don't know what it means. But I think, uh, most foreigners are here for such a short time. There's not, no importance placed on learning, learning Thai. At the same time, Thailand is one of the biggest economies and one of the biggest populations in Asia. So if you think in 10 years, it's very likely that there'll be a lot of Thai people living in neighboring countries more than today, and more of our neighbors, more Indonesians, Malaysians, Singaporeans, Filipinos, uh, Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laos, Burmese living in Thailand, it's inevitable, it's inevitable that there's going to be a language exchange. Um, we have a, a few foreigners working in our company and they're learning a little bit of Thai each day and I think it's vital, absolutely essential. Um, another thing is um, I find that a lot more Asian countries that actually are foreigners here tend to put more effort into learning Thai. Why? Why do you Western think that is? I have no clue. I think. Even the sound is still not the same, or we right. still, like, it's different, but I don't know. It's, it's funny, you know, as a Western speaker, I just assumed when I came to Asia, I assumed that if I met someone who was Vietnamese or Chinese, I would say, oh, you must find it so easy to speak Thai, because <laughs> your languages are so similar. And they're like, actually, Vietnamese and Thai are as strange as cats and dogs. There's no relationship at all. Just like 
you know, everyone assumes that if I go to France, I can just start to remember all the French I learned as a child. But you're right. I think um, from my observation, people from ASEAN countries as well as other Asian countries come here and do much better at Thai, probably because everyone thinks they speak Thai. I'm sure it's because people think they speak Thai and start speaking with them, and then it goes right into the, what I think the importance are, being in the situation, being in the context. So I think we can give a big round of applause for Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Daniel, for this uh, very fun, entertaining, and valuable uh, uh, talk today. We are all thank delighted, you. and so you could see, I'm sure everyone is had a lot of fun today. So let me uh, give you a little of token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you hey. so much. Hey.